Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to speak to other dispute resolution professionals, particularly about this topic. <clears throat> uh, a few years ago, I was invited to speak to the Northwest Dispute Resolution Conference, which takes place in Seattle, normally Easter weekend. Um, personally, it's, it's one of my favorite dispute resolution conferences. I just think they have a great uh, range of speakers and topics and a great uh, range of uh, conversations about practice and theory as well and uh, how they meld together. And the first time that I was there, I was staggered to, uh, first of all, be asked to be part of a panel discussion after lunch, and then to be sat on that panel discussion after lunch, and to look out to the room, the auditorium that we were in. Uh, there would have been about 100, 120 mediators and collaborative practitioners as well. And to look out at this room and to see that the majority of them were incredibly flat, just lacking energy, enthusiasm whatsoever. And this horrified me. As a newcomer to the field, I was excited and bounding with energy and enthusiasm for this way of doing work, this way of serving our clients, companies, communities with our dispute resolution work. And to come into that arena and to see these professionals who were of longer standing than I, to be so lacking in enthusiasm was genuinely alarming. I realized that they faced a challenge that many of us have experienced or are experiencing. And it's this, that the initial wave of enthusiasm that takes us into this work, that appetite or that curiosity, that suspicion that there's a better way or another way of doing this dispute resolution work, kind of tails off after a while. It tails off. We are faced with the complexity with the real difficulty and the real grind of building up reputation, credibility, uh, a sustainable and credible caseload. And for many of these practitioners, this is where they were. For others, their mediation and their dispute resolution work had just become a thing. It was something that they do. So what is it that you do? What are you? Oh, you know, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I do a bit of mediation. They were mediating with a shrug. They had lost that curiosity that took them into it. A year later, I was invited back to the NWDR. And in the meantime, I'd also been asked to speak up in Edinburgh at a conference, the title of which was Creating Consensus. Creating <coughs> Consensus. And I thought, well, there's something here. There is something in this idea of creation that can speak to us within a dispute resolution process. And so I set about writing a talk that I gave there in Edinburgh two years ago called Get Artisan. And it's largely that that I want to share with you. What is Get Artisan about? Uh, despite the rather ugly grammar within it, it is about escaping mediocrity. It is about filling our work once again with uh, uh, design, with craft, and with the enthusiasm that we can communicate to the marketplace. Why? So we can do more of the work that we love, and so we can do more of the work that we really believe in. So Get Artisan and Avoiding Mediocrity. Um, some ideas, first of all, about this thing, artisanship. I think that there's a real uh, renaissance within uh, the crafts and artisanship generally. We see it in the faux advertising, just a bit too much. Everything is artisan. Artisan bread, artisan popcorn, I saw the other day. Artisan freaking popcorn. Uh, so it rather gets abused. Uh, but there, the reason why it's abused is because it's such a potent, evocative concept. There is something deeply attractive about the idea of artisanship and its connection to craftsmanship. When I was doing that first talk for Edinburgh, um, I did some reading around the uh, area. Uh, one book that I uh, particularly appreciated, if not enjoyed, was a book called The Craftsman by Richard Sennett. Um, I'd like to say it's a good book. I've read the book, so you don't have to. It is, uh, it is a book that could have really done with a, a more stringent, strident, um, forthright, assertive editor quite frankly. There are some great points in it, um, but really only read it if, if you've got the stamina for it. It's hard going. Uh, Senate says that maybe craftsmanship is this idea, this idea of the desire to do a job for its own sake. And I quite like that. I quite like that. The, the idea, the naive, romantic idea that, you know, even if I wasn't being paid to do this work, I would still do it anyway. And I think there's, you know, when, when we talk about passion, about enthusiasm, about connection with the work, sometimes we may have felt just that kind of thing. 
Another idea about what craftsmanship might mean is the, uh, to breathe life into noble or beautiful work that inspires. And ladies and gentlemen, there is a potential, an often untapped potential, within our very best dispute resolution work that we do something front of house, right there in a moment, in front of the disputants, our clients who are in front of us, that really moves them onto another place. That, that moment when they see, ah, oh, I get it. Now I see how this mediation, this collaboration can work. Now I see how we're going to be able to move past the conflict that has had us trapped for so long, that has cost us so much in time, energy, and reputation. And now I see what it is that we're doing. Why bother? Why bother instilling craft into our work? Here's a good reason. Do you want to be delivering Barbie doll after Barbie doll after Barbie doll? Or do you want to be like Geppetto, if you like one of the archetypal artisans, craftspeople? You remember the Geppetto story? The carpenter in that Italian village who one evening, one afternoon, comes out of his house and he sees his neighbor throwing out a knotted, gnarled piece of wood because his neighbor can't carve this piece of wood. And Geppetto, knowing himself to be the artisan, the craftsperson, a man at the very top of his game, of his art, he sees this piece of wood and he sees the inherent difficulties within it. And he fancies himself as being able to create something out of this complexity. So he goes to his neighbor and he says, give me that piece of wood and I will make something from it. And he toils, he toils that afternoon and that evening. And you know what happens? He creates the puppet Pinocchio. And his very prayer as he goes to sleep that evening is if only this puppet could become uh, uh, alive, if only it could <coughs> really come to life. He is so enchanted with his work. The skill that he has imbued into his craft he longs to see that then come to life, to breathe life into noble work that inspires. Why bother? Because I don't want to end up like one of those delegates at that conference in Washington, DC, mediating with a shrub. What have you got on today? Another mediation, if you're lucky enough. Please, let's not do that. There's another way. There's a better way. So in looking at how might we make a thing, how might we kind of put a package around this idea of craftsmanship, of developing excellence within our dispute resolution work. Um, from, largely from Richard Sennett's book, I got this idea of three characteristics of craftsmanship. We like threes. Threes in training and talks are good because they're easy to remember. And the three that we've got here are incredibly simple. Number one, connection, and we'll have a look at that in a moment. Number two, complexity that I've already alluded to. And number three, is this quite uncomfortable and quite challenging notion of autonomy, which doesn't mean fierce independence and isolation as practitioners, but it means something quite different, as we'll come to see. So connection, uh, in its own right, applies on three levels. Connection with self, connection with our profession and the trade, the craft in which we work, and connection with our tools and the raw materials that we have to work with. So let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, there's a book uh, by Lang and Taylor, The Making of a Mediator. Has anyone read The Making of a Mediator? Uh, Messrs. Lang and Taylor will be delighted because now you'll all go and buy a copy of their uh, excellent book. Uh, and they talk about this thing called the constellation of theories. Constellation of theories, forgive the vernacular, it's, uh, East Coast Americans would say that this is a bit West Coast. Um, it, it's a bit out there uh, and not all of us might be comfortable with the idea of constellation. So uh, please uh, bear with Lang and Taylor's own language. But what it says is something similar to a very popular TED talk that came out a couple of years ago as well. Uh, a TED talk by uh, a gentleman named Simon Sinek, uh, which is about start with why. <coughs> and Simon Sinek, when he talks on this parallel point, he says that all of us know what we do. Uh, some of us know how we do it. Very few of us know why we do it, let alone communicate our why the motivation why we do the work that we do. And Lang and Taylor were writing about this uh, many years earlier, only in this slightly uh, more arcane way, the constellation of theories. And what they say is that uh, mediators, all mediators, have a concern for the outcomes that are attained by the parties that they work with. 
And what Lang and Taylor say is that outcome in this sense means, a concern for outcomes means that it fits in with the, if you like, the statutory landscape within which this company or this family might be working and operating. So we all have that concern about the outcome, making sure that it fits, making sure that it's uh, congruent. Lang and Taylor also say this, that some mediators, if you like, the next level of uh, sophistication for mediators is to have a conscious awareness of the practices that they are using in order to lead their clients to those outcomes, the kind of interventions that they might employ at any time within a mediation from one moment to the next. Why do I ask this question instead of that question? Why did I choose to reflect or summarize instead of reframing? And to be able to make those decisions consciously and in the moment. If one practice isn't working, to be able to switch to another practice to see if that becomes more fruitful. The next level, if you like, of uh, sophisticated for mediators, say Lang and Taylor, is to be able to connect not only the outcome to the practice, but the practice to the theory. The practice to the theory. And Lang and Taylor exhort this uh, need for mediators to really understand the theory that underpins the practice and to know which theories they really believe in, which theories they subscribe to. So if, for example, you subscribe to, uh, as I do, and it might be immediately apparent, uh, a transformative model of mediation, that communities, organizations, families, individuals can be transformed by the very process, the experience of going through highly effective dispute resolution processes. If I know what theories I'm subscribing to, then I will also know how those theories inform the practices and how I will then execute those practices in the moment. And Lang and Taylor then go to the very core, the core values and beliefs of the mediator themselves. Why we do this work. And I'm, I'm not going to run an exercise. We could like put our hands up and why do you do this work? That'd be uh, inappropriate in, in, in this forum. But there's a challenge there to really uh, reconnect in that get artisan principle, connecting with ourselves and our true uh, motives for doing this work. Because when we're doing work which is meaningful to us, then we do our very best work, and we do our very best work consistently. That's a good thing. So connection, connection to self, start with why. Connect with the profession as well. And uh, uh, Senate uh, talks about the guilds. Now, guilds have become deeply unfashionable, uh, not least since Richard Susskind wrote about them in such damning ways in The End of Lawyers. Uh, the guilds became defunct. They became obsolete. And yet for uh, a couple of centuries, they were, if you like, the, the keystone. They were the heart of the professions, the trades, and the crafts. There is something about guilds that enabled the governance of best practice, of standards. This is something that we're really wrestling with at the moment. How do we, as a profession, demonstrate our credibility? How do we assure a sometimes cynical and suspicious public and marketplace of our credentials and of what it is that we're doing? So the guilds help with governance. They help with the transfer of knowledge and best practice. I'm really interested to see um, uh, how this guild, for example, um, uh, today bringing in practice from uh, America, just streaming it in uh, live sometimes via Skype or other methods. I think there's a real excitement about that. And just a clear demonstration of how when we have the framework of the guild, the organization, whether it's mediation, academy, whatever it might be, then those guilds play a role in transferring new ideas from one town, from one region, from one country continent to the other. So we get this cross-pollination of ideas. And then together, we can constantly push what the state of the art within mediation and dispute resolution work looks like. And excellence. The guilds do have a role to play in driving and maintaining excellence. We need to realize with the guilds that they have uh, their hierarchy. And forgive me, please, the, the gender-specific language, which isn't mine. Uh, again, it comes from the, uh, the material. The hierarchy uh, within the guilds was very much based around the apprentice. You set out on your path as the apprentice, the novice who knew nothing. And there is something about subscribing and submitting yourself 
to that status of apprentice so that you can learn from the masters and from the journeymen uh, above you. So know when we are apprentice. Don't be afraid to step back into that apprentice space from time to, from time, to time when we come up against things that we're not quite familiar with, online dispute resolution, whatever it might be. The next step, journeyman, is a bit more interesting. I always saw journeyman as being a kind of football player who would end up at Portsmouth Football Club. But that might just be because I'm from Southampton. <laughs> journeyman, it's got that rather derogatory tone to it, the kind of middling average competence. Uh, in fact, journeyman, its derivation comes from the French word journey for day. And the thinking is that once the apprentice had served their apprenticeship, they were then expected to uh, get out of the, uh, uh, the master's uh, workplace, to get out of there, to free up a space for the next apprentice coming in, and to get out instead into the marketplace and to charge a day's rate for the work, for whatever craft or profession it was in. I think there is a real challenge in the mediation sector that the apprentices very often aren't getting out of the nursery. I think when we look at in the family sector, uh, for example, when we look at uh, court mediation schemes, uh, when we look at very often well-meaning, of course, um, public services, uh, local government, local authority sponsored dispute resolution schemes, these are places for the apprentices to cut their teeth. But what happens is that the journeymen very often stay in this place. The journeymen and women both stay in this place. Why? Because they're getting the work. They're getting the work that they long to do. It's a steady stream of work coming in, even if it might not be the level of quality that they want to be doing or that they aspire to. And there can be a real challenge about stepping out of that safety, that security and that provision, and going into the marketplace and building your own practice. And we know how challenging that is. It's hard work. So the journeyman, there's, a, there's a, a degree of compulsion there. Get out there. Get into the marketplace. Uh, promote your services. Find ways to transfer that message and the benefits that you deliver to the marketplace. With the end of legal aid, or rather the uh, change in circumstances in legal aid, there was one mediation group that I was talking to on the south coast. Uh, this was some six months before the changes were coming in. And, and I said to them, so what are you doing about marketing your services? And he said, oh, Neil, you don't understand. I really do. Neil, you don't understand. We're not that kind of service. They're now out of practice, unfortunately. We have to get comfortable with marketing and communicating what we offer to our clients, their businesses, and their communities. So we've got apprentices, we've got our journeymen, and then we've got our masters, the real doyens, if you like, of the craft. And the great thing about uh, the world that we live in with social media, with our uh, uh, connectability to all kinds of people, whether it's through the rather dry and austere LinkedIn, whether it's through Twitter, which is my preferred platform, even Facebook, which will have many of us cringing, is that it is now so easy to truly connect with the real leaders in our field. It is so easy to connect with them. Uh, when uh, uh, Stephen Anderson, who I know was speaking this morning, um, and I, when we were starting out as collaborative practitioners, maybe five years ago, something like that now, we did just this. We, we had a podcast, and every uh, fortnight we would get together on Skype and we would chat for half an hour. But what we would have done is we would have uh, reached out to a real master, a real leader in the field, and we would say to her or to him, we would, uh, we've got this podcast, we just put it out there, about 400 people listen to it every fortnight. We would love it if you would come on and just share some information about what you do and how you do it. Would you be prepared to do that? And they said yes. We never had a single rejection. So for about, six, uh, for about a year, we had uh, uh, 24 episodes of speaking to real leaders in the field. Imagine this. There's me, the apprentice, the real beginner. And I'm speaking to practitioners like Ronowski, uh, Hillary Linton uh, uh, in America, in Canada. And for half an hour, I am able to ask them any question that I like. And I am able to learn from them. And in doing so, fulfill my apprenticeship and start moving up through those ranks. Uh, a, a, an interesting thing about the guild as well is that they didn't tolerate charlatans. Does anyone know what the punishment was if you uh, found guilty of charlatanry? 
they'd lop off your ears. They would lop off your ears. Imagine that. If you have found that you were kind of holding yourself out as a mediator and you really weren't, you know, really you were, uh, you were an arbitrator instead. And I'm not saying that there's a... Uh, uh, <laughs> Don't, no, 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 you took offense. Don't do that. Um, I'm not saying that there is a, a qualitative difference. What I'm saying, though, is that one is different to the other. And if we are offering mediation to clients and we are then adjudicating for them, that's a bit different. Uh, the guilds, what the guilds would do is that they would, uh, if you were found guilty of charlatanry, they would lop off your ears. Uh, in that day and age, that, that had a massive penalty. It meant that you couldn't wear a hat. Uh, you, there's uh, some great stuff on this. If you look at John D. Uh, and his friend, he had a charlatan friend that uh, he hooked up with. Fascinating story about wizardry and alchemy and so on and so forth. That's probably a different talk. So, uh, connect with the profession. Uh, really get involved with the profession. Get involved with CR, get involved with Mediation Academy, with the LinkedIn groups as well. Don't just lurk on the message boards, but make a <coughs> contribution. Ask questions. Pitch in with the uh, conversations. Increase your profile. Increase your network and your expertise in the area. The guilds weren't about making us all the same, sometimes people can feel a bit of resistance. That, oh, that means I've got to conform. That isn't what the guilds were about. Instead, they were a federation of autonomous workshops. So we were able to express ourselves and our craft within dispute resolution differently. So we can all do it differently, and yet we conform to the same standards. And if your guild doesn't serve you, sometimes a pushback that I get, I don't like this guild or that guild, whichever sex profession I'm talking to, I don't like this guild or that guild. Well, again, that's really easy. Build your own guild. Reach out to those people who you see as leaders and ask if they will get involved in your community. LinkedIn uh, uh, groups, for example, a brilliant example of just how easy it is to do that. Now, the guilds also made it safe for practitioners to spend time in a space of what I call not knowing, the delicious discomfort in not knowing. When, they, when we don't know something, it is here that we find the opportunity to uh, develop curiosity, to develop something called playfulness. It is here where we start to invent. If we don't know what the answer is, if we don't know how we're going to get from A to B, then we have to start innovating. This is a good place to be. For the lawyers amongst us, and I'm one, we have this blasted curse of having to always be right. And my goodness, isn't that exhausting? having to always be right. It is absolutely draining. We have to have the answer. We have to know what the answer is or how we're going to do it. And if we don't, then our reputation is somehow diminished. This reputation for many of us when we're working as lawyers is built upon this pillar of expertise. This pillar of expertise which is uh, growing ever taller and diminishing in breadth as well. So I'm a lawyer. Uh, in fact, I specialize in family law. In family law, uh, I tend to specialize in uh, financial claims. Uh, predominantly, uh, I deal with financial claims where the parties are earning uh, 50,000 up to 200,000 uh, between them uh, normally. And within that, let's say, uh, in a few years' time, I've developed a further specialism uh, in dealing with professionals in the academic sector. Uh, particularly where we're then having to deal with uh, academic-based uh, um, pensions. You can see how we get this ever-tapering pillar of expertise, and that is the beacon by which uh, I alert my services to the marketplace, and the work comes to me. For the expert lawyer in that place, when something new emerges, something from left field or something from west coast of America, whatever it might be, we're faced with the real challenge. Do we confess that actually we are perfectly ignorant about that stuff? Do we confess we're perfectly ignorant and in doing so lower our status of expertise and accept our not knowing? Or do we, as we might see too often, just dismiss this new field of thought? Thinking, for example, about uh, the, uh, the, the still emerging um, neuroscience, the writing, the studying that's coming out of that. Some of us may feel a certain degree of skepticism, cynicism about online dispute resolution. And it's so easy for us to come up with reasons why not. Why, oh, it won't work here, or it won't work in my sector. Are we prepared instead to tolerate the discomfort in not knowing 
to get curious, to find out more, and to start playing with these methods, with these processes, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and what we might do differently. I'd encourage you to do so. Within the dark soil of our incompetence <laughs> lies the seeds of our excellence. Um, I'd like to credit that to someone, but I'm not sure who it's to be credited to. I'm like Paul McCartney. Do you know Paul McCartney when he wrote Yesterday? Do you know this story? He wrote Yesterday, and um, uh, he was convinced. He wouldn't record it because he's convinced he'd heard someone else play it already. He's convinced it was a song he'd already heard somewhere. Um, this uh, quote might be from someone else, or it might be from me. But the point is that when we are able to recognize we are incompetent in an area, then this is an invitation to start playing with it, to start exploring, to get curious with it. The Guild served as nurseries in which to nurture that potential. Now, connecting with self, connecting with profession, connecting with tools and materials. Um, this guy, fantastic beard. They loved this beard even in Seattle. This, uh, this intimidated them even in Seattle. And uh, John Ruskin was a fierce social and uh, political uh, critic and author um, in the uh, 19th century. He wrote uh, one of his greatest concerns was the impact of the Industrial Revolution on, uh, on the crafts, on the people, uh, uh, the subjects, the, the, the communities, the societies. And he was profoundly concerned. One of the things he was profoundly concerned about was the loss of connection between the workers and the stuff that they were doing. That the workers had been made remote from the product by virtue of machinery and industrialization. The worker was no longer uh, carving or planing, but instead he or she was flicking a switch, pulling a lever, whatever it might be. And he was really worried about what this would mean, not just for uh, society as a whole, but for the individuals, for their real well-being. Think about this for a moment. Imagine the baker, let's call him an artisan baker. And he's got his bakery. And he gets to the bakery uh, at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. And uh, it, it's an early start. It's summer, so the sun is already starting to come through the windows. And as the sun comes through, it just sparkles and glints off some flower dust, which is in the air. He goes up to his workbench, his warm, wooden, worn workbench, which is where he's going to uh, make his bread for his community for the day. On his side, he has a massive bucket filled with flour and a smaller bucket inside it. And he reaches in with this smaller bucket twice, and he tips it out onto the worktop. He knows exactly how much flour that bucket holds. So it's there on a worktop in front of him. And he, he makes a well in the middle in this soft, cool flour. On one side, he throws in a fistful of crystalline rock uh, salt, sharp, slightly greasy to the touch. On the other hand, he throws in just a smaller fistful of sugar just to help the yeast to work in as it goes. Behind him on the windowsill, he can smell it. It's the yeast which is already proving in the water. So he goes behind him, he reaches that jar, and he pours it into the well he's made in the flour. Does anyone here bake bread? Uh, very few of us. Ladies and gentlemen, bake your own bread. A few more of us now we see it's OK. Um, good. So uh, at this stage, there's only one thing to do, isn't there? It's to roll your sleeves up and to get stuck in. It is the only thing that you can do. You can try doing it with a spoon. You'll only try it once. The only thing you can do is to get uh, connected with this almighty, sticky mess. The flour and the yeast and the salt as we work this in, it becomes this uh, almost unmanageable thing, this mass in front of us. Our hands that no longer resemble hands, but just uh, 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 kind of clubs on the end of our, uh, hand, uh, uh, on the end of our arms. We're like the, the Clayman from those, that old Flash Gordon series. And there's only one thing to do, and it's to keep working. Now, for the novice, for the apprentice, we think, oh, it's not working. It's not working. Either it's too wet. And so we're tempted to throw in another half bucket of flour. Or it's too dry and we're tempted to throw in another uh, a cup full of water. But the journeyman at least knows that this is OK. This sticky mess, this seemingly unworkable sticky mess, is what it gets like before we get to the good stuff. This is a phase we have to work through. And so the baker with experience leans in, and they're kneading it. And they know that they've got to knead this for something like 15 minutes. If they don't, they know that the challenge is that although it's going to look like dough, that when they bake it and they come to cut it, the, uh, the, the bread inside is just going to crumble. It's not going to hold its body. 
And for the apprentice, we're like this. And it looks like dough. And we look at it and we stand back and we think, look at that, I'm a baker. Look at our watch, it's been three minutes. You've got another 12 minutes to go. We have to stick it, stick with this. And I think there's something about mediation, dispute resolution, that sometimes we cannot rush it. We cannot rush it. Sometimes we have to give our clients the time in that conflict. There is something about um, managing our clients, these disputants who come to us, about lifting the conflict up before them and letting them see it and to wrestle with it, that brings out a fuller understanding on their part of just what this conflict is and how they're going to resolve it for themselves. So it is with our mediation work. Let's not rush it. Let's not uh, fall into the mistake of becoming so sterile and so removed from the people that we are working with that we lose sight of the real issues for them. Bernie May has got some stuff to say on this that he wrote way back in 2004, and I'll get that passage in just a moment. So connection with the materials. Our materials that we have to work with are those people in the room in front of us and the mess and the chaos and the conflicts that they bring to us. The tools that we have are the questions that we ask and also in the last few years the new tools that are starting to emerge with online dispute resolution. I was really anxious when I was coming down on the um, train this morning. I was anxious that am I going to be the Luddite in the room. It, it's what I'm saying uh, equivalent to wrecking the looms back in the 1830s. A am, I, am I talking against technology, about the way that it opens up process, that it can streamline? And I'm not. What I am saying is this, <coughs> that as the sophisticated dispute resolution practitioners that we are, there is a new tool in our toolkit. It is something that many of us are still uh, ignorant about. We're in a state of not knowing. Let's embrace it. Let's practice with it. Let's play with it. I know that Giuseppe is going to be talking later. And his brilliant idea of, of the online mediation playground, essentially. You sign up and you go and play with this tool in a, in a space, in an environment which is really safe. And this, to me, is genius. This is where we can discover what's working, what isn't working, what are we going to do differently when we take it into our real practice. So get to know your tools. The artisan develops virtuosity in the, in the handling of their tools. They know which tool is appropriate for which situation, for which job. And so it is with our dispute resolution work. So the artisan connected with tools and materials, physically, intellectually, uh, and subjectively. Um, how about you? Going back to Lang and Taylor, just how familiar are we with the range of processes around us that we can use and implement at any one time? So connection, complexity, autonomy. Complexity is good. I hate that line, keep it simple, stupid. I, I really detest that line, keep it simple, stupid, because I think it says so much about the audience that they are incapable or unwilling of embracing complexity. There is so much wonderful learning for us within our own field. If we go to the books, if we go to the sources, if we embrace some of those theories, Let's recognize where those difficulties are and see how we can measure ourselves against them. Complexity is found vertically and horizontally. Now, there's this idea of the adjacent possibility, which comes from another brilliant book, Stephen Johnson, Where Good Ideas Come From. Adjacent uh, complexity, uh, uh, complexity is the, the, the idea of the things that we don't know in other fields. So, for example, in this context, online dispute resolution, we may well be looking at um, GP surgeries and how do they deliver online GP appointments in that context would be a, a perfectly valid way to look. We can look at any other uh, area and just see how they are doing online communications. One moment. Okay, we're done. Uh, how, how they're doing uh, online communications, how they're dealing with these issues around confidentiality, about reliability, about recording and such like. So we can look uh, adjacent to what we don't know, but we can also look vertically as well. The vertically, I would suggest, is the next level of difficulty. The baker who has mastered the basic white dough soon senses that innate desire to make a sourdough, which is so much harder and one that I haven't yet mastered. So, so there's a natural desire to look at the next level of difficulty. 
And so it should be within our mediation work. I've mentioned this book before. I wish I'd got it out of my bag earlier. Uh, Bernie Mayer. Bernie Mayer is uh, writing uh, in 2004. Brilliant, brilliant book. Read the books. Uh, and, uh, and he's writing in 2004 on the, uh, the crisis in conflict resolution. Why is it that the work we do is so brilliant, and yet we're doing so little of it? Even those of us who are doing a lot, as a movement, we are doing a tiny fraction of what we should be doing. And he's got some challenging things to say. He suggests that mediators and dispute resolution professionals don't make it hard enough. Listen to this. By automatically thinking in terms of resolution, we inevitably drift toward a shallower and more behavioral definition of the issues, because those are the ones that are usually the most easily available to the resolution process. So fixation on getting to settlement means that we uh, deal with the behavioral, the easier, the shallower issues. By doing so, we inevitably avoid some of the deeper and more poignant aspects of conflict. The elements that often keep people at odds, in turmoil, and dissatisfied. The number of clients who go through mediation and are dissatisfied with process or outcome at the end of it is way, way too high. He goes on. Uh, often people come to us because they don't want to deal with these more perplexing or frightening issues. Instead, they want a relatively painless, usually quick, and sometimes cosmetic re resolution to easier problems, which can help them avoid facing their more profound issues. So companies who resolve one issue and then find that they've just got more coming up down the track, and they're in this perpetual cycle of litigation or conflict. Bernie Mayer concludes, by offering people a service that's primarily defined along the lines of resolution, we are playing into this tendency, and as a field, we pay the consequences. Our credibility it suffers. When a conflict is brought to us, we define our tasks in terms of steps towards resolution, and we instinctively focus on the part of the conflict that is amenable to resolution, the easy bits. In this way, we can easily play into the conflict avoidant tendencies that we can all experience, but we also play into the hands of those who have an interest in maintaining the status quo. Bernie Mayer says, that if we are really going to see change in our profession, the work that we do, and how organizations, families, communities deal with dispute resolution, we have to go further. We have to go to the next level of vertical complexity, embrace the theory, embrace the practice, and do brilliant work. So as we do that, there we go. So as we do that, we're going to come up against resistance, where we just get stuck, where our clients get stuck. And this is OK. When we meet resistance from our clients, it's easy for us to slip back to an easier line of conversation. Instead of holding our clients in these areas of discomfort, their own areas of not knowing. And it's only by holding them there that they will start to generate their own ways forward. How do we cope with resistance, with this difficulty? Uh, again, taken from Richard Sennett, imagine a successful outcome at the same time as temporarily suspending the need for one. Isn't that sweet? So to imagine what this outcome is going to look like, and then just to be comfortable knowing that, you know, we're probably not going to get there this afternoon, but we'll get there. Let's keep talking. I don't know how we're going to get there. Let's find a way. And we can do this. We have the trust from our clients to enable to do that. So connection, complexity, and finally, autonomy. Autonomy, as I said, isn't that fierce isolation or independence. It's something quite different. Autonomy, uh, the worker, we as mediators, as professionals, become autonomous in that we get to, divide, get to define our role and our profession, the work that we do, in accordance with and in consideration of our core values and principles. The work that we do will be more meaningful to us. It will fit better, and it will therefore be better. The work itself becomes its own thing. The work itself becomes its own thing. We would do this job even if we weren't getting paid. We are that committed to it. The challenge becomes making sure that we do get paid for it and get, make sure that we get paid a proper value for the work that we do. How many mediators are there out there who are not yet being paid a proper value? And the value of the work becomes autonomous. I, I have concerns. I have concerns with the volume of the discourse about access to justice at the moment. Uh, in the family sector, 
it is almost as if the only conversation about mediation, dispute resolution, is access to justice. How do we make it affordable? And that cannot be the only issue. When we are doing excellent work that's connected to our values, that is connected to the theory, to the practices excellently delivered, then the outcomes develop their own value. This is a, a paperweight. It's made in the East End of London by a truly artisan glass blower. Uh, there's some interesting things about this piece of work as a, as a piece of artisan craft. It's got flaws in it. See these? This is where the glaze is blown out, where it's bubbled to the surface. These are imperfections, and yet at the same time, they do not devalue the piece itself. It's a paperweight. It's about that big as paperweights tend to be, like I know anything about paperweights. And the value of this, it has, it derives its own value by what people are prepared to pay for it. I'm curious, why don't you stand up really quickly and we'll see what the value is to this room. Stand up really quickly, go. If you were, oh no, I can't see anyone. If you would, um, if you would pay no more than a fiver for this paperweight, take a seat. No, oh wow, it's a different crowd to many I deal with. Uh, okay, no more than 10 quid, 15, 30, uh, 100, uh, how much would you pay, sir? 120. 120. Thank you very much. So some of you would have only paid five quid, and you would pay 120. Now, uh, the art and uh, crafts person realizes this, and he realizes, therefore, or she realizes that she doesn't need to sell five pound paperweights to make a living. She can, oh, crumbs. She can uh, uh, sell one at 120, which saves her uh, uh, another 23. Is that right? That's right, isn't it? Another 23 sales. If the quality is good enough, and if they are able to identify and make themselves visible to their market and demonstrate the benefits to that buying market. So think about that. Think about how you're pricing yourself and your craft. Are you truly valuing it? Or are we stuck in this apprentice mode where we are selling our fares cheap? Why? just to get the work in so we can convince ourselves, oh no, it's worth training in the mediation. I'm doing, you know, I'm doing 10 mediations a year. I'm not getting paid anything for it. But just ask yourself that question. Have we stepped out of the apprenticeship? Have we really stepped up to the journeyman challenge of charging a proper day rate for the work that we do? John Ruskin, I mentioned him earlier. He had a great uh, book which is called uh, The Seven Lamps of Architecture. And in, uh, in, in this book, he was looking at the architecture in, I think it was Verona, and he was uh, decrying, as was John Ruskin. Has anyone read John Ruskin? John, he was kind of like, he strikes him as being like the Jeremy Clarkson of, of his time. If, if you're looking for someone who can go on an incandescent rage and then sustain it for entire chapters at an end, John Ruskin is probably your man. Um, some some uh, very uh, passionate entertaining writing. Not all of it we might uh, condone in this day and age. I appreciate that. But he can certainly uh, go for it. He had this to say about um, architecture. But what he's talking about is craftsmanship, uh, about pride in work. He says this, all old work has been hard work. It may be the hard work of children, of barbarians, of rustics, but it is always their utmost. Ours has a look of money's worth of a stopping short wherever and whenever we can, of a lazy compliance with low conditions. How many mediators are working in low conditions? Never of a fair putting forth of our strengths. Let us have done, he says, with this kind of work. Cast off every temptation to do it. Do not let us degrade ourselves voluntarily and then mutter and mourn our shortcomings. Let us confess our poverty and our parsimony, but not belie our human intellect. It is not even a question of how we are to do, of how much we are to do, but of how it is to be done. It is not a question of doing more, but of doing better. The struggle I think that many of us face with our mediation work in the desire to do more of it and to do it really well is a, a question of a, a conflict, three conflicts rather. The first is this. It's a desire to do excellent work against a marketplace expectation for mediocrity. I like that. Can you do it cheaper? 
It's the uh, conflict that many of us face, the desire to live a really fulfilled life where we are doing brilliant work that we love to do, serving people that we love to serve, against a half-life where we're making compromises ourselves, where we are not living fulfilled, complete lives. And it is the conflict, the challenge, between just doing a shift, the same thing, day in, day out, and making that shift to truly artisan dispute resolution work. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.